Hi there. Today's chemistry lesson is a progression of the molecular shapes progression lab. Uh, in class or via video, you've already looked at the first four columns, and I'll do a quick review of that, and then we're going to go through the columns five, six, and seven, which kind of finishes out this particular lab. So if you haven't printed out the Molecular Shapes Progression Lab, go ahead and do so. And you need to complete columns one through four in order to get rolling with that. So just as a quick review, um, I'm going to use the examples of H2O, which is on the front side of your Shapes Lab, and H2CO, which is on the second side of your Shapes Lab. In the previous lecture, we went through our first four columns uh, and talked about H2O coming up with total valence electrons, which mean the electrons that are available for bonding or lone pairs. For H2O, that is one from each of these two hydrogens. So two times one gives us the two valence electrons here. And then oxygen, which is in group 16, has six. So that gives us a total of eight valence electrons. The next thing we did was determine the Lewis structure, which is... Uh, found by determining first the neediest of any of the atoms involved in this molecule, and that turns out to be oxygen. Hydrogen is never going to be the neediest, uh, and oxygen as the neediest goes into uh, the structure as the central atom. We single bond the other atoms to it and then fill out the octet, understanding that a bond, in this case a single bond, has just two valence electrons. If we have a double bond, it has four valence electrons. If we have a triple bond, we have six valence electrons. So for these two plus these two, we still need two lone pairs for the oxygen. And this is the Lewis structure for it. Now, when we look at the shape of that structure, what we see is we have a central atom bonded to two atoms with two lone pairs. And the shape for that is bent. And when we look at whether or not there can be symmetry, for this type of shape, because of the lone pairs on the central atom, it is not symmetrical. Okay, so we'll go through and continue with the H2O in just a minute. Let's look at the H2CO that we did on the second side. Again, the two hydrogens, each having one valence electron, gives us two electrons for the hydrogens. Carbon in group 14 has four valence electrons, and oxygen in group 16 has six. So we've got a total of 12 valence electrons. We determined that carbon is the neediest of all of these atom types and needs four more valence electrons to get to octet, so we put that as the central atom. We single bonded each of the other atoms to it, but we found that when we filled out the octet, we had too many valence electrons in a structure unless we did the erase pair, erase pair, add a pair to share. So this is the completed Lewis structure after we did an erase a pair, erase a pair, add a pair to share for carbon and oxygen. When we did our checks, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, we had the correct number of valence electrons plus octet for everything, meaning just a bond for each of the hydrogens, 2, 4, 6, 8 electrons associated with carbon, 2, 4, 6, 8 electrons associated with oxygen. As a central atom bonded to three atoms with no lone pairs, that is a trigonal planar structure. And let me go ahead and draw the ball and stick diagram for that, where we would show a central atom bonded to three atoms with no lone pair, and that's the trigonal planar. Now, trigonal planar can be symmetrical, but only if all of the outer atoms are the same. Since all of the outer atoms are not the same in this one, then the answer to is it symmetrical is no. Now we're going to continue with the next three columns of the shape lab. I'm gonna back up a little bit here, all right. So you have this written on your lab, so you should not have to copy down, but you should be very aware of this. For column five, what we have is electronegativity difference of bonds, not molecules, the bonds. So first we have to determine if the bonds themselves are uh, of high enough electronegativity difference to make them polar bonds versus nonpolar bonds. So what we're going to do is use the electronegativity difference between the atoms that are bonded to each other. Okay, so they have to be bonded to each other, and that's where looking back at our Lewis structure comes into play. We use the electronegativity chart on the periodic table. Let me show that to you on the second side of the periodic table. 
is a chart that is the electronegativity table, and it will give you all of the values for the atoms that we're looking at. We're gonna find the difference, okay? So that could be considered as the absolute value or always subtract the smaller from the larger number, okay? Calculate the electronegativity difference and write polar or nonpolar as the bond type. And just to um, remind you, the values of the differences are right here underneath the table, okay? So we're gonna look to our structure and see that we just have hydrogens bonded to an oxygen, okay? In your lab, your teachers have actually just told you all the different types of bonds that we have, but you should have been able to look here and say, I've got an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen, and I've got an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen. That's the only thing that we have bonded here. So we look at the electronegativity table and find the value for oxygen and hydrogen. Hydrogen is 2.2 and oxygen has a value of 3.4. So I'm gonna take the largest of those two and subtract the smaller from it. So 3.4 minus 2.2 equals 1.2 as our electronegativity difference. Now we check the table that's underneath here, okay? And it tells us that 0 to 0.4 difference is nonpolar. But if you have a very high difference like this 1.2, which is between the 0.5 and the 2.0, this is a polar covalent bond. So I'm going to write polar bond. That's important. That means that both of these bonds between the oxygen and hydrogen on the two parts of the molecule are polar bonds. All right. Next, let's look at column six. Now we go from the idea of polar bonds versus nonpolar bonds to whether or not the molecule itself is polar. And what that means is, does the molecule have one side that's a partial negative and one side that's a partial positive? If it does, then it's gonna set up for all kinds of intermolecular forces of attraction, meaning attractions between different molecules that are different from if that molecule didn't have a partial positive and a partial negative end. So molecular polarity is the molecule itself polar or nonpolar? We're gonna use two items to help us here. We're gonna look at symmetry and bond type, okay? So to answer column number six, we have to look back at columns number four and five. And here's an important piece that you need to fill in for number six, okay? So there are some blanks there. Polar molecules, polar molecule requires any polar bonds, so not just one of the two, but, or sorry, not all, only if it has all polar bonds, but any polar bonds, and no symmetry. Make sure you get that correct. I'm gonna zoom in on it so you can write it correctly into your column five notes. Any polar bonds and no symmetry. However, if what we have is a nonpolar molecule, it either has just nonpolar bonds, all nonpolar bonds, or it can have polar bonds, but symmetry will have killed the polarity. So we're gonna again, look to see, is it symmetrical? And what types of bonds does it have? So let's look back at our water example. This says that we have polar bonds without symmetry, okay? So that means that it falls into this polar mo molecule requiring any polar bonds and no symmetry because with that lack of symmetry it allows the polarity of the bonds to be expressed in the molecule and the molecule will have a partial negative end and a partial positive that means that water h2o is a polar molecule It has polar bonds and no symmetry. If instead what we had were polar bonds with symmetry, then that would put it under a nonpolar molecule. Or if we didn't have symmetry and we didn't have any polar bonds, then all we could have is nonpolar. 
So these are the things that you need to look to in order to determine is my molecule polar or not. That gets us to the last column. Let me back up so you can see all the stuff that's there. Okay, column seven. This is where we can now start to describe the different characteristics that are associated with a sample that contains this particular molecule, like water. We're gonna look at intermolecular forces. Okay. Intermolecular means between molecules, so between different molecules in this sample that contains water molecules. Um, and we're going to look for the strongest. Uh, IMFs is, a, is an abbreviation for intermolecular forces of attraction, um, and we're going to start the strongest. So we need some information about that. One type of intermolecular force of attraction is what we call dispersion forces. This is a relatively weak type of force in small molecules, and it's based on just a movement of electrons, so a shift in the electron cloud that causes a temporary and partial dipole. Temporary and partial, partial positive, partial negative on the part of a molecule. This is present in all molecules, whether they're polar or nonpolar. So for this one, it's gonna be pretty straightforward all the molecules that we're looking at have dispersion forces because they all have electrons which will shift and have these types of intermolecular forces of attraction. Let's go to the next one, dipole. Dipole intermolecular forces are the attractive force between the partial negative part of one molecule and the partial positive part of another molecule. If what we have is a polar molecule, it has dipole forces. Okay, so we're gonna be looking back at um, our column number six in order to get to whether or not we have dipole for a particular molecule. The last type and the strongest type in these small molecules that we're working with is called hydrogen bonding. Now the term hydrogen bonding is still an intermolecular force of attraction. This is kind of a vestige left over from some early ideas that there were actually bonds like covalent bonds form, but there are not. It is a very, very strong type of dipole, a very strong type of intermolecular force of attraction. And this is going to be present when we have polar molecules that have hydrogen bonded to either nitrogen or oxygen or fluorine. So let me be clear, just because hydrogen is pleasant, present in a molecule does not mean that it has hydrogen bonding in place. It has to be a polar molecule with hydrogen bonded to NO or F. That then would be the strongest type. We can't have hydrogen bonding in place unless we have dipole and dispersion. We can't have dipole in place without dispersion forces. So we're gonna kind of run through and do some evaluation here. And I'm just gonna write out the three, dispersion, dipole, and hydrogen bonding, which I'm going to abbreviate as H bonding, but remember that's hydrogen bonding and it's very specific. So let's take a look at our water molecule. Now the first question is, does it have dispersion forces in place? You think about that. And if you're saying absolutely yes it does, then you're correct because all molecules have dispersion forces. So I'm going to circle dispersion. The next question is, does it have dipole forces, meaning of these attractive forces between different molecules? Let's look back up at what that means. Dipoles will be present when we have polar molecules, and indeed water is a polar molecule, as described in the last part of this lab, the Gresham lab. Next, hydrogen bonding. Does water have hydrogen bonding in place? Well, we know that hydrogen bonding is present in polar molecules, which this is, with hydrogen bonded to either nitrogen or oxygen or fluorine. So we have to go back to our structure and take a look at that. So this is a polar molecule, and indeed we do have hydrogen bonded to oxygen, which is one of the three molecule or atoms that hydrogen would have to be bonded to in a polar molecule to have hydrogen bonding in place, okay? So that means for water, we have all three of these different intermolecular forces of uh, attraction in place. Um, and we want to now star the strongest. Well, we know that dispersion is the weakest in small molecules. Dipole is stronger than that. And hydrogen bonding is the strongest type of dipole force 
So hydrogen bonding would be our strongest. Okay, let's start now with our H2CO, which we've already taken that through the first four columns of the shape lab. And now we want to get to column five, which is our electronegativity difference between the atoms. So if we check the structure, we can see that we have a bond between hydrogen and carbon. We actually have a couple of those. So that's one we need to explore. We also need to explore oxygen to carbon. So hydrogen carbon and oxygen carbon. I'd like you to look carefully at this and realize there is no hydrogen bonded to oxygen in this molecule. And that's important because when we're looking at bond polarity, we need to consider just those things that are bonded to each other. Also, when we get to describing whether or not this has hydrogen bonding, this does not have hydrogen bonded to oxygen. It only has hydrogens bonded to carbon, okay? So now let's look to our electronegativity chart. And we're going to first compare hydrogen and carbon. Carbon is a greater value. So that would be 2.6 for carbon. Oops. And we're going to subtract 2.2 from that to get 0 0.4. So for this particular type of bond, hydrogen to carbon, when we check our chart, this is nonpolar. Okay, it's not a strong enough difference to have a difference in electronegativity as in a pulling harder on the electron cloud to give a really strong difference in, electron, or in um, electron density. Now let's look at our carbon to oxygen. And one thing I would like you to realize is we're just looking at the difference in electronegativity for these. Doesn't matter if we have two different hydrogens bonded to um, a carbon, we're just looking at the difference between those two. Doesn't matter that this in our structure was a double bond, we're just looking at the electronegativity difference between these two atoms. So for carbon to oxygen, oxygen is a 3.4, that's the higher of the two. I'm going to subtract carbon, which is 2.6. And we can see that we get a difference, an electronegativity difference of 0.8. If you check your chart, remember that 0.5 to 2.0 is a polar difference for this bond. So this is a polar bond. Okay, so you not only need to do the calculation, but you need to write for each bond type, whether it's polar or nonpolar. Now let's go to our next column. Okay. So we're looking now for molecular polarity. We're trying to determine if this molecule is polar or nonpolar. Remember that we need to compare both symmetry and bond types. Now in this particular molecule, we have both nonpolar and polar bonds, okay? So what we need to consider now is whether or not this molecule is symmetrical. If it's symmetrical, that kills the polarity of the bonds. If it's not symmetrical, the polarity of the bonds is expressed in the molecule and the molecule itself will be polar. So we said that this is not symmetrical, which means that there is no symmetry so the symmetry is not killing the polarity of the bonds, and that will make this a polar molecule. So I just wanna go back to where I was looking. Polar molecule requires any polar bonds, which we have, we have a polar bond in place, and no symmetry, no symmetry there. So this is a polar molecule. That is going to, of course, affect it's intermolecular forces of attraction. So we're gonna go through those again. We've got dispersion dipole and hydrogen bonding as the possibilities here. I wanna ask you, does this H2CO have dispersion forces? And your answer would always be yes, because all molecules have dispersion forces all molecules contain electrons that shift and form that very temporary dipole. 
The next question is, does H2CO have dipole intermolecular forces of attraction? And if we look back up at dipole and its definition, it says, if we have a polar molecule, then we have dipole IMFs. So the answer is yes. The third type is hydrogen bonding. We know that hydrogen bonding is present in polar molecules that have hydrogen bonded to either nitrogen or oxygen or fluorine. So let's look back at all of those criteria. This is a polar molecule, but now let's check to see if hydrogen in this molecule is bonded to either NO or O. Well, the hydrogens in this molecule are only bonded to a carbon, so this does not have hydrogen bonding in place. So that means just dispersion and dipole are present in this a sample that has H2CO. Since dipole is stronger than dispersion, that's going to get our star. Now, another note that um, is part of the idea for this lab is that if we want to know about the properties of different types of samples of substances, we can look at their intermolecular forces of attraction. And what we can say is that the stronger the intermolecular forces of attraction, the greater the amount of energy that's going to be required, as in the greater temperature will be required to melt something versus what is being compared to with less intermolecular forces, sorry, less strong intermolecular forces of attraction. Um, and that will apply also to boiling. So if I were to ask you about the difference between H2CO and H2O, if we considered, hmm, I wonder which one has, has to have more energy or a higher temperature in order to melt it, I would be looking at something that has stronger intermolecular forces of attraction. So it's very possible that water would melt at a higher temperature than H2CO because water has hydrogen bonding as well as dipole, as well as dispersion. Whereas H2CO only has dipole and dispersion forces in place. The stronger intermolecular forces of attraction mean that it's going to take more energy to disrupt the attractive forces between the molecules of a sample of something that has hydrogen bonding, dipole, and dispersion, as opposed to just dipole and dispersion. Next up, your task is to complete the molecular shapes progression lab for columns five, six, and seven for all of the molecules that we're working with in this lab. And I want you to be very, very careful as you're considering this to understand that in column five, we're looking at the electronegativity differences of bonds to give us some information. Then we're using that information as well as whether or not the molecule is symmetrical to tell us about whether the molecule overall is polar. If it's a polar molecule, it has to have one or more polar bonds and it can't have symmetry. For it to be nonpolar, it has to have either all nonpolar bonds, in which case it doesn't matter if it's symmetrical or not, or polar bonds with symmetry, remembering that symmetry kills polarity. Then for the last column, you're going to go through and consider the intermolecular forces of attraction for your particular molecule. And I'd like you to refer back to the information here to help you, understanding that every one of these molecules has dispersion forces in place. If all we have is a nonpolar molecule, it's only going to have dispersion forces in place. It doesn't have dipolar hydrogen bonding. However, if we have a polar molecule, it will have dispersion and dipole intermolecular forces of attraction. And then you should always check those polar molecules to see if you have hydro hydrogen bonding in place which you would have to look for polar molecules with hydrogen bonded to either nitrogen or oxygen or fluorine, okay? When you finish um, all of the structures on this lab, you're going to be asked a couple of questions and compare some different molecules in this set. Um, and a big hint here is you need to look to column seven and the intermolecular forces of attraction that are present and 
the more and stronger types of attractions that you have um, for a particular molecule, that will make that melting point or boiling point higher as compared to something with um, less strong uh, intermolecular forces of attraction, kind of like these two. <clears throat> 